One of the things that we want to do in Escalator is to bring people together, as we've mentioned, to share resources and knowledge, right? And as DH Ignite is something that's still emerging, there are challenges and opportunities. So with the next, so now we're gonna go into our first set of lightning speakers for this entire conference. And they will speaking about South African data sources, challenges and opportunities. And first up, I'd like to call on Ria Olifir from the Antarctic Legacy of South Africa. May we please give her a hand as she comes up to the podium. Hi, everybody. I told him when, I, uh, when we got here and decided on this is that the light goes on. I've put pamphlets on your tables. So um, I'm quickly going to tell you about the Antarctic Legacy of South Africa so that you know why is it a resource for data and for human data? So it's actually about an extreme environment, data that was not previously digitized or not available. Um, as uh, Benito just said, that's specifically one that is restricted and it's restricted within the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research. If it's personal data, if the people don't give their consent, you can't have it on the repository. So I'll quickly give you a quick rundown. So the uh, Antarctic Legacy Project is a project funded by the National Research Foundation within the South African National Antarctic Program. And we've got a big repository. You can ask voter all about it. I'm a very bad client, I think, sometimes. And it's hosted at Stellenbosch University and they're very supportive of me always, trying new things and trying new stuff. So when also Benito talked about what is the data that is there on, there is a little pamphlet and there's more outside of what is available on the archive. I won't spend too much time. It's very interesting. So it dates back. So we've got material even from a little newspaper article from 1899 that's in the Rhodesian Herald that the first person was, uh, there was an advertisement for people going down to the south. And I think, not sure if you how much news you watch, so it's now exactly nearly a year ago that the uh, endurance shipwreck was found. So Shackleton Slay is, for that matter, in Cape Town in the Ezeko Museum. So it's a hi history of a long time, and we don't, not everybody know that South Africa is involved in that article and what we are involved there, and what are we doing there, why are we spending so much money there. So this is the archive. It's open access, except for, I think, um, somebody mentioned uh, narratives. So there are interviews, and there are transcriptions of these interviews. There are some photos that we took off. Um, the, it wasn't previously accessible. Now it is since 2015, it is. Um, so we took off photos, but there is a facility. It's on the DSpace um, setup. So there is a way that you can make stuff private, put embargoes on it, and it can later be, or people can know there is data in this regard. So it started off just off the human, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. But these days, um, I think you mentioned geographical features and maps. So um, it developed a lot since it started in 2009. So what I want to talk about is that um, research is great. Uh, building a base, building a vessel, all these things are perfect but there's always a human behind it. And this is what this comes to. What is the value of the human within the Antarctic program specifically? And how can we specify it? So we created a digital repository. Um, there's a lot of gaps in there. So it's got a team photo, so I'm not sure if you know much about the Antarctic program. So every year the ship goes down to Antarctica, Marion and Gough, and those people stay there for 13 to 14 months sometimes. Um, with no other people around it. So there's not, uh, so if people of, they only eight at Gough Island, they only see eight people for the rest of the year. There's not a shop, there's nothing. So what is their value and their data and their information, their photos, their diaries um, to us? So I've took one guy, um, he's really a great a scientist, a researcher, a very well known in the international environment. He does research on seals and the influence he had on different people along his line. So I brought this book along. Um, if you have time, quickly go and look at it. There's a lot of people that making comments and 
his dedication to seal research in South Africa. So it's a program that's now run more than 50 years. And what is his contribution if I put it on a, in an archive? And I'm not talking here about the big data of the seals that they track and see what they eat and try to cut them open, see what's, it, what's in it. He was also part of the cat hunter people. So what's important? and I should go forward, is the many research articles he's done. There was a specific um, uh, journal in South Africa, and unfortunately it stopped, so it was a scientific journal, um, Antarctic Research for South Africa. It's not available anymore. He's also part of a lot of projects within the international community, and all this is available to us now on the archive. As I said, there's still a lot of gaps. So the articles is not all specifically on the archive, and there's a bibliography that we've done, but it's articles written by this guy in journals. And it's, it's his life, it's history, history, but it plays an important part within the Antarctic program, and an important part in South Africa's history and for the future generations to come. Um, images, uh, it's like you can see the human factor there, and that's what I actually want to concentrate on today because I want to um, what do you say, get a lot of you not to work for me, I can't pay you, but to do research within the archive. I really want it. I spoke to psychologists or in the psychology, political history. Um, there's this archive or digital repository lying there that we must sort of mine and see what we can find out. And what you can do research on it can probably help the Antarctic program. Um, currently, we are struggling getting people to go down to Antarctica. Why are we struggling? Is there a certain barrier, psychology, sociolo sociologically, um, history barrier? What is the problem? Why don't we get people that want to stay 10 months there? I would not last like two weeks, I can tell you that. So I was two weeks in Antarctica, and it wasn't the time when the sun doesn't set. So when you walk out of your room, it's, it's day. It's day for 24 hours a day. It's very horrible. It, 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 you can't survive. If you, I don't know how they do it. Uh, we had to white out. You couldn't see your hand like this far in front of you. And those people can't go out. So we were restricted. We could only use, could only bath or shower every third day at that stage, I remember. And use very sparsely the bathroom facilities because they can't go out and make water that we can use. So all these photos tell a story. And um, I think it is this much human factors in here and it's also the political side to it, the treaty side that we've got involved in. I'm not sure if you read the news or read the Aravalta stuff on um, what's called Daily Maverick. And it's now this whole Russian thing and oil and Japan want to do oil there. And is the Antarctic Treaty is coming up in 2041. Is it going to be renewed? Is it going to still be this pristine continent that's the only place for peace, no war, and not to be mindful for own purposes and for, for money. So a lot of this will come from there. So my conclusion is that humanity's material need to be preserved. That's why I use the digital repository. I just want to also take the opportunity to thank like Sadilar that made it possible to translate Antarctica facts in, I think we now have seven languages, John, I can't remember. Um, it is also available on the archive because what's for me very important, although the Antarctic legacy is to preserve our history and to preserve the legacy, it's also important to promote it, to tell people about it. And that person straight up there in the far north doesn't know about it. And if they, we can tell them in their own language, it's great. So it's a project that's still going on, but it was really on my bucket list. Uh, and that's it. If you want to know more about it, I will be around. Um, the last thing I want to say is that we will have a social sciences workshop. We wanted to do it, um, and that in COVID happened, and that was also in, in uh, collaboration with Sadilar. And what's very important is that um, we are going to do this to see what material is available in the archive. In the meantime, go and look, see if you've got students, see if you yourself want to be part of it. Um, I've spoken to a few people, There's, they've got their own language, I can tell you, those people got their own language. There's words there that you don't, that we don't use. So thank you and thank you for the opportunity to all the organizers. Thank you so much, Ria. Um, we have time for two questions. Are there any questions, any comments? 
Sorry, I put leaflets on the table, but there is more outside, and there's a QR code that will lead you directly to the archive as well. Yes. Thanks, Ria. That was fascinating. Uh, where did the cats come from? Sorry, I know it's a bit of a simple question. It was, it was a huge, I won't take too long, but you can read a lot about it. It was huge in the news, actually, at that time. I think there was a, um, one of the radio guys, and he was actually, why do we kill the cats? There was mice on, the, on Marion Island, and then they took the cats to get rid of the mice. And what happened, the cats, why do they need to chase mice if they, there's thousands and millions of birds so they just start eating them so if anybody of you want to have a project there is currently the marion free mouse project and we're now starting because what the mice is now doing that they are a huge invasion they're eating the birds and it's horrible go and check out the mouse free marion project and they start eating out the brains of these birds so it's a huge environmental impact so we still need to get rid of the mice <laughs> horrible but true. <laughs> very, very interesting indeed. Um, okay, our la next lightning speaker is Renee. I'm not going to try to pronounce her surname. I think I'm going I'm to get it wrong. But it's Renee from um, Mozilla Common Voice. Let's give her a hand as she comes to the podium. Afternoon, everyone. So. Today I'm going to be discussing a, a project that is very dear to my heart and it's the Voices of Mzanzi project. So the point of the project is to develop speech data for machine learning technology in all of South Africa's official languages. So it's a, it's a rather big project and at the moment it consists of various phases. The first being the localization phase. So before we get to the various phases, Let's just quickly discuss what is the Common Voice project. So the Common Voice platform is a platform that Mozilla has made available online and it creates an environment where you can upload speech data, you can create data sets, and everything is available as Creative Commons Zero. So it can be used for just about anything you can think of. The reason why we've chosen to use this platform is because it, create, or it creates an environment that is easily accessible to most people and that can be adapted in many ways to incorporate a large variety of data sets. So one of the primary tasks that we've undertaken is the localization of the platform for all 11 South African official languages. We've also gone about uploading sentences, so written data sets that can be used as a point of departure. Sorry, I think I go too close to it. And the main point of this whole project is to create the data sets that feed technology and the future of our languages. When we think about very commonly used products, like for instance Google Translate, we find that some of these projects do not accommodate South African languages. Um, <laughs> in this case, we're only speaking about the official languages. We're not even taking into consideration the smaller languages. And one of the primary reasons that these languages are not accommodated at the moment is primarily because there is such a small percentage of that language that is actually available on the internet. So the language isn't represented on the internet. There's no data for them to use to build these kinds of machine learning technologies and to develop technologies in those languages. So <laughs> we can't all be programmers. We can't all develop fantastic technologies but we can build the databases that can be used for these kinds of technologies. And that is what we aim to do. We started, let me just quickly, ah, there we go. So the initiative started with the goal of creating data sets that represent how real people speak. So everyday common language, actual genuine language use. 
And one of our primary goals is to create a parallel corpus that is both written and spoken. So this corpus can then be used for any kind of technology, but it can also be used for general research. It doesn't have to be used for technology. Um, after that, we've created these data sets as basic data sets. But one of the main points is to create a system that is self-sufficient and that can be used for future generations. So the ideal is not to create a temporary project, but a project that can last for decades. And this can only be done by community building, by teaching communities how to provide their own data, how to build their own data sets. And one of the reasons why the Mozilla project is such a benefit for these kinds of projects is because it's easy to use. So you have two options. The first is to donate speech. And that can be done as easily as this. You can go onto the website, you can click a few places, and you can start recording. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be quiet or done in a studio. You have real world language data. The second option is to listen. And if you decide to listen, that means that you're validating data. So the quality control is also being done by the community and by people who are first language speakers, second language speakers, but who are comfortable in that language and actually know how to use that language in real world contexts. This project has various different sub projects that have also been undertaken one of them being community building, um, teaching people how to upload smaller languages, teaching them how to localize the platform for their own languages, creating data sets that can be used for anything from graduate research to developing technologies to developing apps, whatever the need is within the community. So I'm going to be here the whole week um, you can come by any time. I also have a stall at the back. And please come and see me. Come and talk to me about what it is that your language community might need, what you might be able to contribute, but also about how this data can be used in innovative new ways to ensure that we optimize it and that we keep the project going. Because if communities are involved in establishing their own data sets, and contributing to the way that their language is portrayed within the larger technological and larger digital world, then that creates a sustainability that we won't be able to create without it. So please come see me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, are there any questions? There we go. Thank you very much, amazing presentation. So I note the statement you made. You said it can be used for anything you want to use it for. Yes. And you also said um, um, widely accessible. What do you mean by accessibility? And where does disability fall within what you do? Because for me, when we talk of accessibility, we are talking of disability, but it also looks like now, when we talk about accessibility, we don't really mean disability, accessibility. No, so in this case, I'm not specifically referring to disability, but we have had uh, blind speakers donate their voice data because the system is very easy to use. Um, I don't have a demonstration because I only had three minutes, but when you go onto the platform, it's very visually stimulating. So it's, it's very easy to use. Um, for someone who uh, is hearing impaired or um, might have a, a different kind of disability, there are different ways to make the, the website more accessible. We're actually currently working on uh, getting the languages integrated into an app that can work offline 
because one of the big issues with accessibility of technology is that technology is often only as accessible as the internet connection is. And when you have an offline app, that means you can upload data, you can go into more remote areas and collect data um, without that being an issue, which in South Africa, <laughs> under our current circumstances, is a big barrier to entry, if I want to put it that way. Um, I can't remember your first question. Have I answered it? Anything yes. you want to use so it for. you can use it for anything because it's Creative Commons Zero. It can even be used for um, a product that you might sell and make a profit from, but it can also be used for community-based projects. Um, so the, the underwriting of that copyright is completely open. So you can literally download the data sets in text file or MP3 file or WAV file, whatever you need to use. So that makes it comfortable data to work with. Any other questions? Yes, uh, this side. I, I think my question will kind of flesh um, a bit to that question. But for me, uh, Benito talked about collective benefit, uh, where you collect data from communities or disabled people. Once you collect that data, it becomes ring fenced by the app and the terms and conditions of the app. And you've also mentioned that you can either use the data for commercial purposes, then where do that collective benefit comes from in, the, in, in that sense? Thank you. So at the moment, we're not using it for commercial benefit at all, but it is something that's not prohibited by the licensing. And um, I think where it comes in is when we talk about making a language digital or making digital spaces available or accessible to a language community, if we think about something like uh, a personal assistant like Siri or Alexa, or if we're speaking about something like a screen reader, text-to-speech, speech-to-text, those kinds of technologies, they ultimately en enable a community <laughs> language community, thank you, no uh, Knox, I see you. <laughs> and they enable those c communities to gain access to knowledge, but also to reuse that knowledge or that information by providing it in their language or um, being able to communicate or interact with the technology within their language, if that makes sense. And that does provide alternative opportunities for language communities that didn't have those options before. Um, when we think about a language like Isin Debele, um, there, there's very little data available on the internet in that language. And so that community might have to wait a couple of years longer before something like Google Translate works for them, whereas a larger language community might have those technologies at their disposal much quicker. And so if we create data sets and we actively work on focusing on these under-resourced under languages, then that speeds up the entire process for the entire community. Okay. Thank you so much, Thanks. Renee. Thank you. May you please give a hand. Okay, um, you might be sitting here thinking, uh, I don't know about this lightning talks. Um, but again, remember we're here to connect and learn and grow, right? And one of the things when I listen to lightning talks or short um, bursts of information is to ask myself, um, okay, not just completely discarded, but I might not need it, but someone else I know might need it. And as we're growing and we're connecting, it's very, diff it's very important to know, broaden your knowledge. So let us hang on to our hats and let us um, stay engaged, stay involved. And I actually, so um, what I saw in December, there was a lady from Colombia who had visited South Africa and she was literally using um, speech recognition to help her, uh, well, to do her shopping. She would speak onto her phone and then she could tell the people what she wanted. And I mean, that's one, I think, the first thing that I thought when I heard Renee speaking of Mozilla Common Voice was that, that we need to do this with our languages. 
So this is not my time. This is Professor Hussain's time from UCT. Let's welcome him to the podium. I must say I feel like a rock star when I see a monitor down here <coughs> with my slides on it. This is new technology, right, that we're all trying to get into grasp with. I'm not talking about mice. There are no mice in my presentation. And also, I want to uh, maybe disagree with the last speaker. You can all be programmers. Uh, and, you know, I've got to say that because I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I've got outline for what I should put into the slides, so I've tried to follow the outline. Who am I and why am I here? Well, I'm here because I'm a researcher in this field called digital libraries. I was quite impressed when we saw that very complicated figure earlier today. Right in the middle of it was digital libraries, right? And it was a centering of this notion of how we build digital archives and then how we use this to support the digital humanities. So what I do in my life, spent the last uh, uh, some years building actual digital archives where we have found that there were very specific reasons why we couldn't do this using standard tools. And with some of the things that I've built, uh, this is before we had standard tools in some cases, uh, but some of the, these are very custom uh, designed solutions to meet very particular needs. And when you go about doing this over and over again, you start to see that there are some emerging problems. The first problem is that it's not all that easy to build an archive. I had lots of people here who have done this will tell you, it's not all that easy. Well, you can find some expertise. You can find people to help you. And there are a lot. And today we are very lucky because lots of universities have people who can help you. But not everybody has that. And you can't all be working side by side with the professionals in libraries at universities, for example. Not everybody has the money and expertise. Archiving is very expensive, right? People who scan newspapers, for example, you have to raise money, and often that money is coming from some other continent so that we in South Africa can scan the newspapers that are part of our cultural heritage. So this is a bit of an issue. And then the third issue here is that there are lots of important collections of stuff that people have. People are, there was a definition of data. I like to tell my students data is stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff that we have, and we don't know what to do with it, and, it, there's, and it's at risk of actually being lost. So you can't find a lot of important information that is about the heritage and the history of our country today because it's lost. So on top of all of that, the space is rapidly evolving. Technology is changing and the way in which people are work, uh, working is also changing. So how do we address all of these things? So I'm a researcher in digital libraries and, and what I've been working on in recent years, and some of you may have heard me speak about some of this before, is I'll ask myself, can we come up with a simpler solution? Now, not everybody needs a simpler solution. Some people have Sanjan, who's going to talk later, right? where you can go to the person, and they will be able to help you. But actually, not a lot of us sitting in this room do. right? So lots of people do, could do with a solution that is simpler to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Now, I'm not selling this. This is a research project. right? So I'm asking the question, can we do this? Can we do better than this thing called DSpace, this thing called Omeka? Can we build something so that you don't have to become a computer scientist or hire a computer scientist, and we are very expensive, by the way, <laughs> right? Or hire a computer scientist in order to get your archive up and running. So the Simple DL project is an experimental toolkit where the entire notion is to address the problem of complexity and to address this issue raised by the last speaker, that sometimes you go into a community, there's no network. So how can we build solutions that work in South Africa? And hopefully, if they work in South Africa, they will work in countries that have even less resources than we do. Right? So this is the, our goal. We attempt to do as much as possible, if not everything, offline, static, so that your entire computer system can fall apart and you do not lose your data. And these are the experiments that we are doing. Um, I won't talk about the technical detail about this. Uh, there's a couple of processes involved in this. There's, there's some papers. There's a GitHub link. I know people are talking about open stuff. You can actually download it and play with it yourself. But I will warn you, it's a research project. So you, you probably will have to ask for some help along the way. Why are we doing this? And where are we going with this? Right? So at the moment, what we are doing is 
I've, I've decided to work with a small number of people to build prototypes to explore different ideas. So there's a couple of different archives. There's five or six of them, and they're all based on this one software toolkit. But what we want to know is, how well does this perform? So we are exploring a number of things. In fact, you know, each of those things corresponds to one postgraduate student, I would say. Yeah, I think so. So one thing is, how fast does this work if we ran it on your cheap cell phone? Because we don't necessarily want to run this on some powerful server somewhere. Can we manage this remotely so you don't have to install the software yourself? That's another student who's working on that part. So we want to, to test to see the limits of what can be done if we reduce the complexity of the archiving system itself. Can we make it simpler for everybody out there? Anybody who doesn't have the techni technical expertise, can they just simply do the archiving? And then, of course, being good researchers, I have somebody whose life is devoted to theorizing about this, right? What is the underlying theory for how we build these systems so that we don't go through this over and over again and try to solve other problems as we go through um, building computational systems? And so the next step here is, and these are some screen snapshots of current uh, prototype systems that I'm working with. Um, so I'll, I don't build archives. I, like, I say this, this with a pinch of salt here, but I, I run quite a few of them. But I don't like to build archives unless there's a hard problem. So if, you're, if you are somebody who is trying to start up an archiving project, you can talk to me. The first thing I'm going to figure out is, is there a standard solution for you? Can I send you to Voter, and Voter will figure it out for you, and that'll be the end of it? Or is this a hard problem? Are you working in a certain space in the digital humanities where you are trying to do some things that haven't been done before? And then I would be, be glad to talk to you because then we can explore new things, we can explore new ideas, new services, and push the boundaries of the digital humanities one step further. At some point in time, we need that national heritage portal. Gosh, this project has been on hold for anybody who knows about it for 10 to 15, maybe longer, more years than that. And uh, hopefully, if everybody has these archives all over the place, we can get back to creating something that we can be proud of in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? What questions do you have? Apparently, that's a better way of asking a question. What questions are there? Are there any questions? The lecturer Comment. in me says I should ask you questions. Yep. <laughs> you, it's a joke. Do you, you, you can? No. <laughs> Are there any questions? No. Okay. Oh, there is a question. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a, perhaps a hard question, and that has to do with your hard problems. So how do, you, how do you figure out whether something is a hard, or how, how can we figure out whether it's a hard problem? We, do we need to talk to you first to figure out <laughs> if a problem is hard? <laughs> well, that's, a good, that's, that's not a difficult question. Uh, so like good researchers, right? If you are looking for the solution to a problem, you can do some research, go out there and find out to see if there are uh, A, existing solutions in the research literature, but uh, better still, existing open source software tools, or even commercial software tools. You know, sometimes we really have to give in and go commercial, right? But um, are there tools that exist that solve the problem? And if you can't find the answer to that, then come talk to me. Great, thanks. <laughs> if you can't find the answer to that, then it's a hard problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I fully understand it's a, a difficult problem to build an archive. One question is, um, does, is, does this belong to, the, to UCT? Do they fund it? Um, my question is about governance and management and sustainability, because the word archive goes with 10 years or more sustainability. Right. So the, this is an interesting question, right? So the, the, what we're building is an experimental software system. This is not going to last forever, right? Well, one day it's either going to become some standard open source tool or it's going to go away like many experiments go, do. What we want to do is we want to influence the production of tools by other people. 
That's the most important thing. We want to influence the whole world of people out there who build these kinds of tools. Um, I know a lot of them, and I think they're doing it wrong. <laughs> And uh, the fact that we have to hire some European organization to install a repository toolkit for us, this is wrong. Somebody has, has done this incorrectly, right? So we, we at UCT are just experimenting with the tools. The idea is that eventually institutions themselves should host their own archives. Um, I would take that one step further to say that I'm a strong believer that um, the way this is all going to be successful in the future is if everybody could make copies of archives and make copies of sections of archives because I think, I think disaster is coming for lots of people. Um, and you, know, you never know when there's a flood in the building where your data is stored. Right? And this happens. Um, so the solution is actually not to hang on to it and keep you know, one central copy, but to spread this out as far as possible. Right? OK. Thank you so much, Prof. Let's give, please give him a hand. All right, so um, in case you're wondering, how do these people end up doing this? So you all filled in the form, right, to be here today. And part of the things that we asked is, how would you like to be involved in the event? And some people said they'd like to do a lightning talk, and that's why they are here. Um, there are some, again, DH Ignite is about collaboration, right? It's not about our voice, but the people's voice. So some of the things that we are still going to be doing, we will be doing interviews, we will be asking participants to write blogs. So if you want to do any of that, you can come talk to me or Knox at the back. I mean, you've seen Knox. Um, because we really want to hear every everyone's voice. Um, and next up is Dr. Haley Hayes, Robert, also from UCT. Let's please give, him, give her a hand. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here and start networking and also to learn and grow. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at UCT um, at the Center for African Studies this year, and I was tasked last week by my PI to assist with digitizing um, the, the CAS, the Center for African Studies archive, which is an ongoing project at UCT. Um, started, I think, over a year and a half ago. So it's it's basically it hasn't been made live on Ibali, it's on Ibali, but it hasn't made, been made live yet. It's still in construction. So my task is to look for gaps to, um, to sort of assess what's been done um, and just review you know, everything that's been um, digitized to date um, in terms of decolonizing knowledge from a different perspective. So I'm here to learn a lot. Um, I'll, go, I'll, look, I'll talk a little bit about my own you know, reflections around working in archives and design solutions I've come up with. Um, with no resources, basically. So I thought it might be just looking at the archive as a muse, as a way to be inspired to do different things with the archive, including digitizing, making it accessible to, to, um, to, to broader publics, international publics. All right, so working at the different museums, I worked at the Luanle Migrant Labor Museum, where I also looked at the archive, worked with their archive, and. Um, took a lot of folk photographs, which are part of their archive as part of my research process, but also looking at um, different aspects of, of how archives can point us in the direction of, you know, suppressive practices that are still in the landscape. In this case, it was stencil typeface, still being used by the city of Cape Town or the municipality in Luanli itself on the hostel walls. Um, just looking at an example of the kinds of research and how buildings become archives and what I see in the landscape that I want to look at in, in, in detail. Um, working at the District 6 Museum, I was working on the Two Rivers Project, which looked at forced removals in the southern suburbs of Cape Town. So Protea Village below Kirstenbosch, Newlands Village, Claremont, Harfield, Black River near Red Cross Children's Hospital, and Mowbray. But when I, when I was uh, given this position to, do, to be the senior researcher, I, there was so much, and it was all in different, it was huge, and it was also very scattered. So I had a big problem, and what I did is I, I actually ordered boxes from Waltons, 
um, big A3 boxes that you can open. And I took a lot of imagery and I created collaged lids. So this is Harfield, Harfield Village. Um, on your left, is that, that is actually the archival box cover, which I scanned. Um, so in that, you'd find all the oral histories, transcribed oral histories, photographs, maps, um, just academic journal articles, books, anything that I could find that related to that area collated into that box to create a system. So when you go into the archive, it's very overwhelming. And for many teachers or students or researchers, it's very hard to find information. So I tried to create order in the archive by, by creating this box system, which could then be digitized at a later date. That was the whole plan, to digitize that. Um, of it was de dependent on funding through the British Council. So unfortunately, it didn't reach the, the digitization phase, but it was, it was my way of interpreting the archive or working with the archive. Um, was, I also worked at Iziko uh, Museums as a social uh, history educator, where many of the different sites, there's so many sites, there's such a gigantic archive um, all over the place. So the buildings themselves are records and, and archival. Um, and I worked in community as well, a lot with people bringing their own archives, their own images, their own photographs, their own memories towards creating a, an event which I um, facilitated at Hoer Constantia with the Constantia Heritage and Education Project. So here, um, here we are making a beautiful uh, artwork and collage based on people's uh, own personal photographs from their archive, which is such a lovely process. And so often process is forgotten in these things. You know, it's all a rush to finish things and make something uh, tangible, but I think processes are so valuable in everything we do. Um, using slave registers, using sites such as for Constantia, looking at an archive um, and the vast repository at, that Iziko has in terms of fashion t and textiles, um, really activated students, fashion design students. I worked with the Design Academy of Fashion, Elizabeth Galloway, and also um, the Cape Town College of Fashion Design. So we looked at many different aspects, slave histories, buildings, narratives, oh, everything. But a lot of it was actually based in the archive, including clothing, slave attire. So archives are valuable, but there's just so much. And I think it's quite overwhelming in terms of, um, you know, do you get a 3D scanner? What's the next step? So just questioning how to digitize, how to make these collections, which are mostly hidden from public view, very much alive. Um, and one student designed this beautiful dress based on the Hrua Constantia slave bell, which was quite inspiring. Um, thank you. So uh, basically, I, yeah, I've tried to work with archives. Last year, I was a, a postdoctoral fellow at, history, at UCT. Um, and in the Mellon-funded History Access Program. But because of COVID, we had to do everything on Zoom. It was, it was quite interesting. It was hard, but I managed to do collage workshops, and we, did, we took academic texts that we would be working with and made the most beautiful collages. We did podcasts. We did poetry. We did exceptional things, and it's all curated online with the help of Libby Young, who's a UCT service provider. I mean, she was the person who has all the, the knowledge and expertise, but it was just a, such an incredible learning curve for me in terms of how to utilize what we've done as academics, put them in, a, you know, create a visual culture for, for academia and make it accessible, I think. And that's the most important part is allowing everyone to access, not just um, students at university or academics, or, but you know, anyone can see what we're doing, what our work is about. Um, so I think that's, that was quite an exciting project to work on. And yeah, and so the next step is the Center for African Studies, assisting the archive, um, you know, grow and develop. And, and um, yeah, there are many things that I'm, look, I'm gonna assess it this week coming up, the next two weeks, and then, um, in our pers first postdoctoral research um, fellows seminar, I'm going to provide an overview of what I've found, what I've read, what's been done. It's it's a long process, you know. 
It's not a quick thing. I'm sure everyone here who's done that, worked with archives, will know that it's a, it's a process that never ends. And if I think of the Jagger fire and what happened with the loss of that archive, with that terrible fire, you know, I think there is a push to digitize, to create um, digital humanities repositories. And, you know, I'm very inspired by actual, the actual archive itself. And I go on many excursions with students, taking them into the National Library of South Africa, on tours of their archives and repositories, and also the Western Cape archives in Rowland Street, which is also a wonderful source of many histories and just incredible repositories. We're so lucky in South Africa and Cape Town as well. We've got these beautiful um, spaces to learn so much about our past about and enrich the knowledge we have. But I think the digital route is the route now open to us. Um, and yeah, it seems like quite an expensive thing to do. But um, as I said, I'm also here to learn about that <laughs> aspect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions, comments, anything, something? Yeah, so maybe just a comment that uh, can definitely be looked into. A few years ago, I think it was at the 2019 DH Conference, international one, there was quite a few interesting uh, talks specifically on materials and the history of materials and using computer vision to analyze, you know, the different trends, the different colors in a way that was used over time. And when you're also speaking about the fashion things, um, I think that, that could be some interesting uh, areas to also look into. And I think that's, again, what, what makes an archive so wonderful if you can make it open, because there can be use cases beyond what was maybe originally envisioned. But if, if the data is open, if it's well described, you can get people from consumer studies now doing research on, on, on certain colors that was used during a certain time, even though it started out focusing more on the text that's being digitized. So mm. it's really useful to keep it open. Yeah, thanks. I know Google Arts and Culture digitized the Isi Shwe Shwe ex um, collections at Iziko. So if you go on to Google Arts and Culture, you'll see part, most of that collection digitized, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, there's so, many, there's so many opportunities. And I've heard about 3D scanners. I haven't used one. I don't even I know what it look, looks like, but maybe UCT has one. Uh, someone will let me know, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Haley. Thank you. Um, and as Prof said, sharing, 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 and piggy banking on information that's already available. I think I'm taking that one home. Sharing, sharing, sharing. Don't start from scratch. It's probably there somewhere. So also speaking to what John is saying about making it open um, and available to people from different disciplines. And our last lightning speaker for this session is Dr. Sanjin Muftik from UCT as well. May we please give him a hand? Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Sanjin um, Muftik. And I think I wanted to do digital humanities since I finished high school. Um, I'll tell you how, because my parents asked me, OK, what do you want to study? And I said, well, I, I really want to study drama. I want to be an actor. And they said, no, we don't think that's a good idea. We're not sure you're going to make it. And I said, OK, well, I like computers. Can I do both? And I was lucky to go to a place where they didn't really seem to care what you studied. They just let you rock up the credits. And what was really nice is that the, um, the computer scientists would have all their classes in the mornings, and they would be done by 12, and they were left to code. And the drama kids only woke up at 12 to go and make theater. <laughs> Um, so I was lucky enough that I managed to do both those things. And after spending many years doing drama, not as an actor, um, mostly as a teacher, I ended up at um, Digital Library Services at UCT, where I'm going to talk about, um, I think, the easy solutions <laughs> from Professor um, Hussein's things. Um, because one of my tasks there has been to help people develop sites that showcase their archives, digital collections, whatever word you use. And that platform is the one you've heard mentioned a couple of times today called Ibali, which runs on this Omeka S software, um, 
what, how we describe it differently from other web publishing software is that it actually asks for metadata, a lot of metadata as you upload things. So you can't really upload anything without describing it. But it also gives you a lot of flexibility to decide how do you want to describe things. Um, so that's why we call it a showcase site, meaning that you can take a number of different collections and showcase them in a number of different ways. And hence why we call it Ibali, because the idea is being that you actually write, tell, engage in a story as you are navigating these collections. And you can do that both from as a creator and as somebody who just comes on the site. So a lot of the work that we do in supporting people who come to us is, see this little graph there is like your journey to build an archive, kind of, more or less. And we really look, the two areas we focus on is the ingesting part, so how helping people with classify, document, take care of things. Where could it be enhanced in terms of how it's being described? Before we look at, okay, if you want to put it on a site, how do you present it? How do you make an interesting user experience? And this is where, I guess, Omeka S comes in. So I cheated, and they said three slides, but then the one slide became a video. Um, so this is just giving you a tour of what Ibali is and some of the highlights in terms of it. One of the first sites is this works of art. So that's all the works of art that UCT buys or from its students. It's categorized by different, the metadata structures it into formats, but we've also tagged it to where on campus it is. So you can go to an actual building and see, well, here's all the works of art that are hosted in that building. So that's kind of the things of presentation. This one is a library of open education resources about climate change. These people spent a lot of time on metadata. They really metadata everything from the topics to learning approaches to social development goals, sustainable development goals, and they wanted all of that on their site. And they also wanted people to contribute and add resources, which is what the software also kind of allows you to do. What's the next one? Oh, yes, this one you talked, we saw a little bit earlier from Jonathan. Um, where we looked at making those, both the Word documents and the images of the books available for you to look through and then be able to download. But I guess the real highlight in, um, in, for me in this one is how um, they started looking at articles within a newspaper and being able to actually categorize each article according to the topic and subtype and the software can then create little facets and filters for you to search so you can quickly jump in and look for specific articles related to fashion, for example. Um, the most digital humanities one is probably this one, and it's the closest to my heart because it's from drama. So there's a research group that's researching Greek tragedy on the African continent. They're doing interviews, and you can see it presented here, but then they're also doing this crazy thing where they have somebody recording their rehearsal process. And if you know drama, they rehearse for like six weeks to come up with just a one-hour show. So there's somebody who sits there and records and captures and archives all of their rehearsal things and then tags the people in it with the keywords and puts it online so you can actually see how the production was made. Um, and that's been one of the, I guess, obviously you can tell it's kind of one of my favorite ones because it's within something that I kind of come from. But you can watch their rehearsal process in that. Um, sorry, just giving you a whirlwind tour. This one was a rebuild of um, Refoto SA. They take pictures of landscapes over many different years, so you can actually see the difference in how the landscape has changed. So we put the pictures up and you can zoom in and out. You can also look at a map and see which pictures are located within that, um, within that particular quadrant, so you can compare the different um, collections of the different people who've taken it. And I think one of my last fancy ones is we even made a website on ourselves on the Jagger Library Fire that was mentioned to look at the history of what has happened and we had a timeline. And this is just a little bit of the back end to show you that we spend a lot of time working with people figuring out, well, how do you want to describe what you're putting up on Ibali? What is the thing that will make it interesting for your users to be able to tell stories through it? And we've also looked at customizing it in a way to add things like supporting titles in many different languages, especially the ones that come from our part of the world, so that it's not just a unilingual platform. Um, and this is just the final kind of tour of the back end to show you how it kind of connects. I'm not really going to explain how it works, but it's, 
an open source thing you can download, but it does require servers and quite a big kind of setup, so it's not as straightforward perhaps as simple DL, um, but it is something that from the libraries what we hope to do is provide support to people who do want to build archives. Um, so they work in partnership with us. Um, we usually like to have a couple of data stewards or people within that group who are focused working with us with that. Um, we try to stick to metadata standards that librarians like and the digital world likes so that one day maybe all these archives can interconnect because we can pull from each other. We spend a lot of time talking about data curation. Um, it's really sometimes difficult to convince humanists, thank you, humanists to <laughs> Like, try going into a room with drama people and say, so what's your data? Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges that we have, is just to kind of, how do you objectively look at what you're working with as data, as opposed to something that's like, no, this is my creative work. You know, that balance between the two. Um, and I think what's really interesting for me is, and this is maybe where it gets a little bit, you can, the whole thing around, you can have a collection, but how you present it, is never objective. It kind of reveals a lot about who you are and what you've decided to put in and out. And I think with what, I mean, I guess I'm a bit of an advocate of Omeka S because I feel like the, the system can allow you to actually be transparent about what it is you're including and not, and actually build different sites off of the same collection and actually say, well, this author has highlighted these things, but this author has highlighted something else. So I think, within the digital humanities field, there's that space for many different points of view and many different stories to tell. And I think that's something that even though working at a library feels like, no, this is the official institutional thing, that within digital humanities, on the other hand, it's actually more about allowing many different voices to be heard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yes. Sorry, just, just a comment and then a question. A comment is for the previous speaker. Um, I think we can help with 3D scanning, by the way, um, at, at the Stellenbosch University at, in the library, so if you don't have access to one. Um, question, well not, not a comment, uh, sort of a question comment for uh, Sanjin. Um, you didn't really say much about triple IF integration, but I think just about everything you showed in your second slide <laughs> yeah. um, was very much triple IF. And uh, you, do you mind just saying something about the power of that, not just in Umika, but um, as a technology for sure. digital humanities? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so um, I didn't, thank you, Walter, because I didn't mention that. So triple IF is something that we also have running on the system. It stands for Inter International Image Interoperability Framework. And it is a global society that sets up, it set up an infrastructure where every time you have an image, it comes with the metadata attached. So if you know, I mean, now you navigate websites, you can right click on an image and download it and it saves it as a file name, but you have actually no idea. You're not carrying any data along with it that describes where that image came from. So they're working very big. It's, it's not an easy thing to set up <laughs> and to actually operate, but basically what we had going and what we have going with the plant, like you so the plant, um, sorry, the landscape collection, as well as with some of the work on the is it Osa Intellectual Traditions Archive, is that every time you encounter an image and you download it, or you can actually see the metadata that comes with the image, which just helps keep track of things as it moves along. Um, it also makes the images openly accessible to others so they can actually take the metadata file that connects the image and give you the image together with it. Um, it's not the easiest thing to sell in like a few minutes. It's, it's a very powerful tool. Um, it is really not easy to set up, um, but I think there's a growing community and there's an aim to kind of move a lot of images to that to make it easier for researchers to keep track of the visual data because that's a big part of digital humanities. Much. Um, is there any other question, comment? Okay, thank you so much. So I was telling my colleague now that I think um, Dr. Sanin's um, 
presentation was quite mind blowing because he had an entire video, like an entire tour of the website on his video. And I was so shocked when he sent me his slides because he used the Sunren file sender and Sunren will be here tomorrow telling us how to do this. So I thought just to mention it because I was like, I mean, you could, if it's slide, just send them by email. But now I understand why and I think it's pretty cool. Um, I'm definitely putting that in my bag to, you know, I, I really think it was cool because often we do want to show the contents of a website and then we do screenshots, but they're not saying much. So that was pretty cool. Um, so we're gonna go to our online speakers. Do you have any questions, comments online? No. Well, that is, do we have any comments? So tea is ready. Um, we're supposed to break for tea at half past two. Um, and while we're here, so one of the, so we mentioned that Escalator has different tracks. One of the tracks that we really worked on last year was the Empower track, where it's basically a track for women in the digital humanities space, a safe space for women to grow in digital humanities and computational and social sciences. So last year, we used to have a meetup every month and in that meetup, we were going through the entire research life cycle. So we have videos that were recorded in those sessions. We have some material that was also created last year. And now what we're doing with that material, we are turning that into a course that is going to be open source on Moodly. Um, and literally, it will be basically, and um, Inonge will tell us a little bit about that a little bit later. But basically, we are building a course around the research life cycle. And um, we do know that we have some librarians and people who might be in involved in course creation, and we'd really like to just show you what we have in mind and get some feedback from you about it. Um, and we will do that a little bit later. So details are coming. So this is like just a, by the way, this is something that's in the pipeline and something we'd like to get. Like I said, we want to hear your voices and your opinions of what we're doing because this program is for people in digital humanities, not just the Escalator team. 